John chapter 20, verses 1 through 18. Not 8, but 18. The King James text today reads, The first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, unto the sepulchre, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Then she runneth, and cometh to Simon Peter, and to the other disciple, whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, They have taken the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth and that other disciple and came to the sepulcher. So, so they ran both together and the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. And he stooping down and looking in saw the linen clothes lying Yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him, and went in to the sepulcher, and seeth the linen clothes lie, and the napkin that was about his head not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. For as yet they knew not the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again unto their own home. But Mary stood without at the sepulcher, weeping. And as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the sepulchre, and seeth two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord. And I know not where they have laid him. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus, oh, glory, standing and knew not that it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? She, supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. <laughs> Why, that little lady, <laughs> she thought a lot of herself, didn't she? That she would go and find the body of Jesus and return it herself. Verse 16, Jesus saith unto her, Mary. She turned herself and said unto him, Rabboni, which is to say, Master. Jesus saith unto her, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her.
Glory to God, amen. I'm telling you, I can't, I can't read this story without feeling the Holy Ghost. Because I do in fact believe this to be a true witness today. Will you bow your heads with me a moment? Father, once again, God, we love you so very much and we are so grateful for the anointing of the Holy Ghost that we feel in the house of God today. How can we talk about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is the crux of our faith, which is the foundation of our faith today, which is the hope of heaven that we hold in our hearts today? How can we talk about this and not be moved and not be emotional, not be excited, not be thrilled? Oh God, today how this preacher needs the anointing and the touch of the Holy Ghost. Lord, I want to communicate to the people of God the word that you've given me. I want to do it effectively. I want to do it powerfully. I want it to go forth, Lord, and to change lives. Not just change minds, but change lives. I cannot do that today, O oh God, without the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Touch me. Touch the hearer. Let our ears be opened and our hearts prepared to receive from the Word of God at this hour. And O oh God, today enable me to share it in a manner that is pleasing in your sight. That will bring forth fruit in the lives of every hearer. For we ask it in none other than Jesus' wonderful, precious name. Amen. Praise God and amen. We live in a world today where people are fascinated by the notion of death and television is inundated today with all kinds of programs that uh, involve themselves with the supernatural, involve themselves with uh, that which might occur after death. You know, people want to know what happens after we die, what transpires after we die. When someone experiences body, bodily death, uh, it is not altogether uncommon for them to be revived and others around them to say, what happened? What happened to you? Where did you go? When, you know, what was going on during that three minutes or five minutes or ten minutes, whatever it might have been, that you were physically dead and the doctor said you were physically dead? Where did you go? What did you do? What did you experience? Because people want to know what's on the other side of the grave. What's on the other side of death? We've got scientists and unbelievers who tell us that death is the final door. Once you exit that last door, there is no more consciousness. There is no more reality. There is no more existence. We simply slip into darkness the lights are turned out, the power is turned off, and there is nothing more. That's it. You're done. Case closed. Many people have speculated as to uh, what it is that Jesus did following his death on the cross of Calvary. The Word of God tells us that on the cross he uttered the words, It is finished! And the scripture says that at that moment he gave up the ghost, meaning he released his spirit. His spirit and his body were separated one from the other. The human body now lay dead without life. But that did not mean that the spirit within was dead, neither will it mean after you and I have died that our spirit within will no longer exist and will no longer uh, be able to experience consciousness. But Lord, where have you been? I can only imagine after Lazarus was raised from the dead by the Lord Jesus Christ, 
having laid in the tomb four days. I can only imagine how many people ran to him and said, where have you been? What have you been doing during this time? Because after all, you know, if death is just the end and there's nothing more, then I want to know that. If there's something more to death, if there's consciousness beyond death, I want to know that too. So I can only imagine that people ran to Lazarus and asked him, where have you been? I can only imagine that after Jesus had raised the widow's son back to life, as he's being carried in his funeral procession to his final resting place, I can only imagine the conversation between the mother and son after a while. Son, where have you been? Where did you go? What happened during the hours that you were no longer alive and there was no life in your body? Where did you go? What have you done? On the cross of Calvary, Jesus had a conversation with one of the malefactors who had been crucified, one to the left and one to the right. And one of the men full of bitterness and negativity said, oh, you know, he's no better than any of us. If they're hanging him on a cross, then he's got to be just like us. And the other man looked across at him and said, no, no. Before I found myself on this cross, I had opportunity. I'm, I'm, I'm using a little bit of uh, editorial license here, okay? Before I was hung up on this cross, I had opportunity to hear of this man. I had opportunity perhaps to hear him speak or hear him teach. And I can tell you, he's a good guy. This man doesn't belong up here with us. We deserve what we're getting. He does not. Master, remember me when you come into your kingdom. See, that thief had to have some exposure to Jesus. He had to have some knowledge of Jesus. Or else, why would he say these words to the Lord? And the Lord Jesus Christ responded to him and said, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. And many, even in theological circles, even in Christian evangelical and fundamentalist circles, many will try to tell you that Jesus saved that man's soul right there on the cross. Hallelujah, glory to God. And he assured that man that he would be in heaven with the Lord that day. Wrong. Wrong. I can't say it any plainer. That is the most screwed up theology that anybody has in my whole life growing up as a kid in a fundamentalist Pentecostal church. I heard that tripe preached over and over and over and over again. That is not what happened. After the Lord was raised from the dead, he should have been able then to have said, I've been to heaven. I've been in the presence of the throne of God. But that's not what he said. When he appeared to Mary after Peter and John ran back home, having found the tomb empty, Mary Magdalene remained at the tomb and she speaks to this man that she assumes to be the gardener. And when he finally calls out her name, and all of a sudden she hears that familiar lilt in his voice. Oh, hallelujah. He says, wait a minute. I, I, when I hear my name spoken by this man, it, it sounds familiar to me. I, somebody else has called my name. and it's, uh, See, it's just like when my great-grandmother or my grandmother would call my name, I would know immediately it was my grandmother or my great-grandmother. Their voice immediately would register because when they said my name, they'd always say it just a certain way. That You know, it would always come out. And their voice, uh, in my mind, was married to them speaking my name. And Mary recognized, my God, 
This is Jesus. She cries out, Rabboni, which is to say, Master, what's the first thing Jesus says to her? He says, don't touch me. Don't touch me yet. Why? I have not yet ascended. So obviously on the cross, he either would have to be the biggest liar on the planet, or somebody is misinterpreting scripture by suggesting that on the cross he saved this man's soul and that he was going to be in heaven with this man that day, later that day. Well, the truth is Jesus is not a liar, so that leaves only one good answer, and that is people have misunderstood, misinterpreted, misrepresented. If you think LGBT theology is goofed up, i got news for you, folks. The church has got a long history of screwing up a whole lot of stuff, not yes. just the LGBT theology. Yeah. Oh, I mean, they, they've got a long history of creating some really goofed up theology. You can't be saved without faith in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is what the Word of God teaches. If that be true, then nobody could be saved prior to the resurrection. Right. Secondly, the Word of God tells us that by being the first man, the first human being, born from the dead by the power of God, that Jesus Christ is, as the writer referred to him, the firstborn among many brethren. We become born again Christians. We are guaranteed a place in the rapture. We're guaranteed a place in the uh, redemption of the church. If the thief on the cross were saved, that would mean, number one, he was saved without any knowledge of or faith in the resurrection. Number one. Number two, listen to me carefully, it would make him the firstborn among many brethren. Never thought of that, did you? That would make him the first person ever born again. Uh, no, to be born again requires the resurrection of Christ. To be born again, we need the Lord to be the first one born again, born a second time. So, therefore, it is impossible for the thief to have been with the Lord in heaven. The Lord said, I have not yet ascended, number one. So that solves that problem. Secondly, the thief cannot possibly be saved without faith in the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. If we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God hath raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. And thirdly, he cannot be the firstborn among many brethren because Jesus is the firstborn among many brethren. Okay, so theologically, that whole argument goes in the commode. It, it, it's a completely foolish notion. When Jesus said to the thief, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. The truth is that the word in the Greek that is translated paradise is a term that the Jewish people in ancient times used to refer to a place of holding, a place of waiting, listen to me carefully, that was actually part of hell. But listen to me, but it was not a place of torment. It was not a place of tears. It was not a place of pain. It was not a place of fire and flame and darkness, but rather it is described as being a garden, or, like the Lord said, a paradise. So you think God isn't big enough that hell can have its bad neighborhoods and its good neighborhoods? Sure it did. Where would the believers from the Old Testament who were looking forward to the arrival of God's promised Messiah, where would they go after death? Oh, well, they'd go to heaven. No, they wouldn't. Even the Jews do not believe that they would go to heaven. Even the Jews did not embrace that thought. They believed that they would go to a place referred to as 
Abraham's bosom. Got news for you. What they described as Abraham's bosom is exactly what is described in the Greek and translated as paradise. Paradise and Abraham's bosom were one and the same. Everybody from Abraham to all the way back to Adam, everybody from uh, Abel all the way up to Malachi the prophet who had ever looked forward to the arrival of God's Messiah went to a place of waiting. But they were still in effect in prison. You know, we talk about uh, there being country club prisons, that there are some prisons in America that are hideous, horrible, terrible places, and you surely would not want to spend so much as an hour in those places full of violence and death and all kinds of horrible things. But then, for the white-collar criminal, they've got these wonderful prisons that they can go to. They've got tennis courts, and they've got ping pong and they've got all these wonderful things they can do and their cells are more comfortable and things are much nicer of course you're still locked up you still do not have the freedom to come and go you still cannot uh, you are still separated from your family you know you still are in prison but it's a much more comfortable prison it's a much more accommodating prison well, this is the case for the Jews. They believed after they died in, in waiting upon the Messiah that the saints of old would go to Abraham's bosom. If you remember the story of uh, Lazarus and the rich man, and the Bible said that the rich man died and Lazarus died, and how that uh, it said that the rich man was in hell, and it said that uh, Lazarus was where? In Abraham's bosom. Now, obviously, that does not mean that Lazarus was inside of Abraham's breast, okay? No. But it was referring to a place, not to, you know, a physical location in that regard. And they were able to see one another. Abraham could see the rich man in torments. The rich man in torments could see... Lazarus with Abraham. Am I telling the truth? What did they say? What did Abraham tell the rich man? He said there is a great gulf between us. What does that mean? That meant there was some type of a canyon. There was some type of a crack. There was some kind of a separation that separated where Abraham and Lazarus was from where the rich man was. Lord, where were you? Where have you been? Three days you've been separated from your disciples. Three days you've been in the grave. Where have you been? Most Christian theologians and preachers among them believe that the New Testament books from Matthew through Revelation constitute in their entirety a new covenant or a new contract with God and the full revelation of his plan, his righteousness, his nature, his person as revealed to us in the person of the man, Jesus Christ. The truth, however, is that the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, are an account of the bridge that connected the Old Testament with the New. Salvation's message and plan is not fully articulated in the four Gospels because that was not their purpose in being written. Their purpose was to reveal how God accomplished the fulfillment of the Old Testament and the establishment of the new through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Gospels are a bridge to the New Testament. They do not in and of themselves constitute or reveal the New Testament. 
In the message preached by Jesus Christ, we learn that the new covenant is fully and entirely rooted in faith in the Son of God. God revealed in human form, himself the Lord Jesus Christ. The law is no longer the basis of our faith, but rather now the basis of our faith is the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Throughout his entire earthly ministry, all Jesus ever preached was, believe on me, 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 believe on me. Does that make the message of the New Testament Belief on Jesus, like so many churches preach and so many preachers teach. Does that make that the only requirement for heaven? Does that make that the only thing one needs to do in order to spend eternity in the presence of God? No. Because Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were not written to show us the message of the gospel, the but the four Gospels were written in order to show us how God bridged the Old Testament with the New. How he did it. How he accomplished it. He sent this man, Jesus, who was the embodiment of himself. The physical was man. The spiritual was God. How that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Philip, how can you look at me and say, show us the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I and my Father are one. Boom, there you go. The Gospels are there to help us understand how God fulfilled contract A and established contract B. But the full terms of contract B were not revealed in the Gospels. No, the Gospels were there to show us how the Lord established it. The full terms are not there. Listen now. Romans 8, 1 through 11. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Listen. For what the law could not do, so it was impossible for the law to accomplish this, what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh. God sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, or the carnal mind is God's enemy in, in effect. For it is not subject to the law of God, and neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, now wait a minute, Paul just said, he just said, let's read it again, he just said, um, verse 9, but ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, 
He is none of his. Is he talking about two different spirits? No. The Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ are one and the same. He just got through saying <laughs> Okay, he's talking about the same spirit, but he refers to the same spirit first as the spirit of God. The second time he refers to it as the spirit of Christ. Mm -hmm. But we know the word of God said, for by one spirit are you all baptized into one body. Right. Whether you be Jew or Greek, whether you be bond or free, whether you be male or female, you're all baptized into the same body by one spirit. Jesus Christ is God in human form. But listen, and if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. Well, of course, because if you've got the spirit of Christ in you, then his righteousness is in you as well. And if God isn't looking at your flesh anymore because the law addressed sin in terms of the flesh, but if God now is looking at your spirit, what is he seeing? He's seeing the spirit of Christ. He's seeing perfection. He's seeing mm -hmm. holiness. He's seeing righteousness because the spirit of Christ is in you. Wonder why we preach the baptism of the Holy Ghost? You wonder why we say you need to have the spirit of God in you? The baptism of the Holy Ghost is imperative. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be. If so be. So Paul is not assuming that everybody he's writing to has the Holy Ghost. Mm -hmm. Well, according to Baptist, the minute you pray your little cute prayer down in front of the preacher at the front of the church, you receive the Holy Ghost. Oh yes, God imparts the Holy Ghost to you. Tongue talking, that's of the devil. Tongue talking, that's demonic. No, 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 that's not necessary to receive in the Holy Ghost. No, when you get saved, according to Franklin Graham and Billy Graham, and you pray a little prayer at the altar, you immediately get a portion of the Holy Ghost. The Bible does not teach that. Paul said, the upper coast of Ephesus when it came upon certain believers and said, Have you received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? Right. So obviously you don't get it automatically right. just simply because you believe. He then goes on to tell us in Romans 8, But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. If the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, Paul said, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit of life is, excuse me, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. Now listen again to verse 11. But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead, dwell in you. He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his Spirit that dwelleth in you. So how are we going to participate in the rapture? How are we going to participate in uh, the Lord raising up his people from the dead, how is that even going to be possible? Well, it's easy. Because the Spirit of God that has filled us is going to reanimate our bodies the same way the Spirit of God that occupied Jesus reanimated His. So that's why we need the Holy Ghost baptism. That's why we need to be filled with the Spirit. Because this is all part of God's gospel plan. This is all part of the process. But now listen. Jesus Christ came to establish the new covenant through his death, burial, and resurrection. Salvation and redemption were not possible until after Christ arose from the dead. If anyone attained heaven and eternity in the presence of God prior to the Lord's resurrection, they would have been the firstborn, the firstborn among many brethren. So we know that the thief could not possibly have done this. 
Romans 10 and 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. The apostles, witnesses to the life, ministry, death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, were given the express responsibility of disseminating the gospel established by Christ on the cross and consummated by him on resurrection morning. The apostles and the apostles alone were to preach the message of the New Testament. And the message they preached consistently was that of Acts 2.38. Repent and be, be ye baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For this promise is unto you and to your children and to them that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. So this Holy Ghost they had just received on Pentecost uh, day is the same Holy Ghost that they said that God was going to pour out on every believer from now till Jesus comes because he said this promise is unto you to your children to them that are afar off even as many as the Lord our God shall call this wasn't just a new this just wasn't a uh, a dispensational thing. This wasn't just something for a certain pocket of believers during a certain period of time in history as our Baptist friends and many others in various denominations would try to have us believe. That is not true. In Galatians chapter 1 verses 6 through 9, the Apostle Paul writes to the Galatians, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, Paul says in verse number 8, Galatians 1, but though we, meaning the apostles, or an angel from heaven, Preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you. Let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again. If any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. Now we understand the need for and the value in the New Testament writings, meaning the epistles. God endued his apostles with the message of the gospel. And the New Testament epistles were written so that this gospel might be clearly expounded, defended, and understood. The only historical account of the actions and the message of the apostles and the early church following the Lord's ascension is found in the book of Acts, which is also known as the Acts of the Apostles. It is in the book of Acts that we find the first sermon ever preached. The first ever presentation of the gospel message and the consistent testimony of the apostles' ministry and their message. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John do not articulate the message of the gospel, but rather the means whereby that message became the new covenant between sinful man and a righteous God. 
Ephesians 2, 18 through 20, Paul writes, For though, excuse me, for through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now, therefore, ye are no more strangers and foreigners. Remember, strangers means somebody seeking asylum or uh, uh, someone who has uh, come into your country from another land. He said, you are, you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. Whoa. What is the foundation of the church? The apostles and prophets. I have literally had fundamentalists try to argue with me because they hate to admit that the church of Jesus Christ is built upon a man, uh, a foundation comprised of men. But it is. The apostles and prophets. God gave them alone the responsibility and the authority to establish the New Testament message. They're the only ones that have that authority. Paul said, if anyone else preach any other message unto you than that which ye have received of us, let him be accursed. He said, it's not another gospel. He said, it's a perversion of the gospel. Do you follow what I'm telling you now? So why do we call ourselves today an apostolic church? Because we believe in the testimony of the apostles. We believe in the message of the apostles. And we preach, teach, and believe the same thing today that the apostles of Jesus Christ taught, practiced, and believed in the first century. Amen. 2 Peter 3, verses 1 and 2, the Apostle Peter writes, This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. Say, Pastor, I don't understand where this plays into. Where have you been? We're getting there. I'm laying some foundation. I want you to understand. You better, you better get your theology right, folks. What then did the Lord Jesus Christ do in the Spirit while his body lay cold in the tomb. See, again, the reason I've, I've shared all this groundwork is you had the Old Testament, the Old Covenant. You had the New Testament, the New Covenant. You had the Gospels, which were written to tell us how God bridged the Old Testament to the New Testament. But toward the tail end of those Gospels, Jesus is dead, lying in a grave. Where have you been, Lord? What have you been doing? Because that's part of the bridge. That's part of what connected the Old Testament to the New Testament. It's important to understand. Listen. He had now created a bridge by suffering and dying on the cross of Calvary. And all those who had believed forward to his coming were waiting news of his arrival. According to the word of God, Jesus descended into that part of hell referred to as paradise, a garden, a place of waiting. So that at the moment, oh hallelujah, I'm going to get Pentecostal and happy. At the moment of his resurrection, he might lead those who had been held captive away from their captivity, hallelujah, and release them into the presence of God, their Savior. He took possession of those who had been in holding, and he led them upward and released them to God's paradise. Now, no longer referring to a place of holding, no longer referring to Abraham's bosom, but referring to heaven. Hallelujah. Got news for you. When the Lord came out of the tomb, immediately 
immediately Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, <laughs> and all the Old Testament saints were released upward to the presence of God. And when Jesus finally ascended, because he said to Mary, I have not yet ascended. When Jesus finally ascended, he had all the saints of old, hallelujah, there to greet him with a standing ovation. Hallelujah. He had all the saints of old there to rejoice and celebrate what he had done for them. Word of God said, out of the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. John the Baptist came as a forerunner to Jesus. He declared that the Messiah had come. Isn't it interesting that John the Baptist was killed while Jesus was yet alive and ministering? Guess where John went? He went to paradise. He went to Abraham's bosom because the old, the old covenant was still in effect. It didn't change until Jesus rose from the dead. So therefore, he goes to the Abraham's bosom and he said, Oh, I've got good news for you. I've got good news for you. Messiah's come. We're getting out of here soon. Hallelujah. And the saint said, yeah, we heard from another fella. What? What are you talking about? Yeah, we had a fella come down here. He was only with us. Abraham, how long was he here? Oh, about four days. What was his name again? Oh, Lazarus. <laughs> what do you think Lazarus did? During his four days in the tomb. Where do you think Lazarus was during his four days in the tomb? He, 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 hoo, hoo. he was in Abraham's bosom. He was telling them, Messiah's come. I've met him. I know him. Oh, hallelujah. We won't be here long. Out of the mouth of two or three witnesses. They needed more than one witness. That's why Lazarus had to die. That's why Jesus, oh, hallelujah. That's why Jesus said to his disciples, let, no, let's wait a while. Let's wait a while. Let's wait a while. He went in a hurry to get to Lazarus because the saints in paradise needed Lazarus' testimony. Wow. Woo! Glory! <laughs> Isn't that powerful? Because the law, the Old Testament covenant, required out of the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. The saints of old had to hear from more than one source that Messiah had come. Well, we know Lazarus was there to tell him, and we know John was there to tell him. Hallelujah. All oh, praise the name of the Lord. Isn't this exciting? It is. It is. Amen. Now listen. Almost done, but I, if I have to take an extra minute, I hate to tell you, I will take an extra minute. In Ephesians 4, verses 8 through 10, the Lord answers the question, where have you been? Jesus, where have you been? In Ephesians 4, 8 through 10, the word of God said, Wherefore, he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. Listen to verse number 9. Now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. In 1 Peter 3, verses 18 through 20, what does the scripture say? Out of the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. P uh, Paul just told us in Ephesians 4 that before he ascended, he first descended. Well, we know he didn't ascend until after he had come out of the tomb, till after he resurrected, right? So he didn't ask him prior to that. 
So first he did what? He descended. So what happened during that four, uh, three days he was in the tomb? He descended into the lower parts of the earth. Now listen to what Peter said in 1 Peter 3, eight, uh, 18 through 20. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might, listen, bring us to God being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Verse 19, By which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient, when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. So what is Peter saying? He's saying that in effect, that holding place where the saints of old were, their spirits were in this holding place. He said they were waiting for the ark to be completed. See, the new covenant, Jesus is the ark. Jesus built the ark. But they were waiting for the ark to be completed. And the word of God said he led captivity captive. It's like this. Picture it like this. You go to a prison. And you say, okay folks, listen. I want you all to get on this bus. And we're together going to drive out through the prison gates. You're going to be with me. You're going to be in my vehicle. We're going to drive out through these prison gates and you're going to be free. But you're not free yet because you're in the bus. The door's closed. The driver controls when that door gets opened. Oh, hallelujah. He led captivity captive. They were captivated now by him, but they were captivated so he could take them out of captivity. <laughs> hallelujah. Mm. Woo, my Lord have mercy. He preached to the spirits in prison. My God. Lord, where have you been? Well, Mary, I had some work to do. Right. You see, just because I now was dead in the body, the work that I had come to do in the body was finished, but there was still work to be done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But it was work that I could not do in the body. I had to do it after I was dead so that my spirit was in a place to go and to preach unto the spirits in, in mm -hmm. paradise, in Abraham's bosom. Mm -hmm. You follow what I'm telling you? It says, so when I died physically, I still had a work to do. I still had a work to do. Now, I had built a bridge. Now I had to help lead those people across the bridge that I had built. Hallelujah, mm -hmm. glory to God. The Word of God tells us when Jesus came up out of the tomb that several people who had just died, people who had just died and just been buried, literally came up out of their tombs as well. You remember that? Mm -hmm. Remember the Word of God saying on resurrection morning, hallelujah, wasn't just Jesus who rose from the dead, there were others who rose. Oh my God. So now you not only had the testimony of the apostles telling us the message of Christ and telling us what the Lord had done, but now you had people who had been dead and in their afterlife experience had been with the Lord in Abraham's bosom. Said, I got news for you. Hell is empty. There are no believers in hell anymore. <laughs> There are, no, there are no saints of God in Haiti anymore. No, no, no. They all, the Lord put them on a bus on resurrection morning and he carried them all up out of there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And then he said, now here, Abraham, you drive the rest of the way. I've got to talk to these folks here for a while. See, I haven't yet ascended. But he led captivity captive. Mm -hmm. Glory to God. He allowed them, you finish the trip. I've got now I gotta do some more work here on earth yet before I go. Oh, hallelujah. Lord, where have you been? In Hebrews chapter 9, 13 through 28. For if the blood of bulls and 
of goats and the ashes of an heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament. That by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. He's saying when somebody writes a will, the only time that will is enforced, the only time the conditions of that will come into play are when the person who wrote the will dies. Jesus was the writer of the Old Testament. In order for the Old Testament to be complete, in order for the Old Testament to come into force, he had to die. Oh my goodness, have mercy. But listen, Paul continues in Hebrews. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is of force after men are dead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Mm -hmm. Whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats and with water and scarlet wool and hyssop, and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. See, there was a contract God had made, but who did that contract benefit? The Old Testament. It benefited the people of Israel. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood, both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these that the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should offer himself Often, as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. Hallelujah. Oh, I want to tell you, Lord, where have you been? I can just see Mary now asking the Lord, Lord, where have you been? 
And the Lord says, Mary, I came to this planet 33 and a half years ago because I had a plan. There was something I needed to do. It involved me dying. But when I talked to my disciples and I explained to them that I had to go into Jerusalem and I had to be betrayed by the, uh, by the high priest and by the, uh, the uh, leaders of the synagogue, I told them this was going to happen. I told them that I would be crucified. I said, but y'all forgot I also told you I would rise again. Right. See, they had been told all this. None of this should have been new to them. He had told them this. But you see, their unbelief, their inability to believe that anybody could beat death prevented them from anticipating that he would rise again. The reason the Romans put guards in front of the tomb was because, not because they believed the Lord was going to rise again, but they were afraid that human beings would intervene in order to make it happen, to make it appear as though it happened. Let me put it that way. And they wanted to prevent the, uh, the trick, you know, being played on the population and it being made to appear that Jesus had risen from the dead. So they put the soldiers out at the tomb. But Lord, where have you been? Mary, I've been building a bridge. I've been fulfilling an old covenant so that I could establish a new. See, the whole plan here, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, is explaining how I came, who I was, what I was doing. And everything hinges on me. See, the gospel doesn't hinge upon baptism. The gospel doesn't hinge upon the baptism of the Holy Ghost. If you don't know who Jesus is, if you don't believe in Jesus, then none of these things matter. Mm -hmm. You're just getting wet. You're, you know, if you don't know who Jesus is, then none of these things matter. No, the entire gospel hinges on the identity of the man, Jesus Christ. He said, I still had work to do after I died because in fulfilling the old covenant, there were some loose ends had to be tied up. I had all these Old Testament saints in holding. What was it going to do? Just leave them there? What's it going to do? No, I can't do that because I fulfilled. I did what they were looking for me to come and do. So now I had to go and I had to release them from their place of holding, from their place of waiting. Call it, if you want to, a country club prison. I had to release them from that place. And I had to lead the captive captive. I had to lead them out. I had to take possession of them and remove them and bring them so that they could be free and I could release them upward and they could go on to glory. And then when the time came for me to ascend, they were there to greet me. They were there to thank me. We used to sing a song in the church. God said, I'll thank him. I'll praise him for saving my soul. When I get to heaven, I'll lay my burdens down. I'll see the king of glory receive my home, my robe and crown. I'll thank him. I'll praise him forever and ever. I'll thank him. I'll praise him for saving my soul. Jesus, when it came time for the Lord to return to heaven, he didn't return to an empty heaven that he then had to fill. He returned to a heaven that was already full. Hallelujah. Because he had already provided for the salvation of the Old Testament believers and the Old Testament saints. Lord, where were you? Well, before I ascended. I first descended. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. I hope this message was a little bit of an inspiration for you today. I want to tell you something, honey. When you feel like God isn't there, when you feel like the Lord is somehow missing in your circumstance and in your situation, just give it a couple days. He'll show up. <laughs> Doesn't mean he's not doing some things. He's still got work he's got to do. He's doing some things. But like we learned from the story of Lazarus and 
uh, his death and his resurrection, don't worry about it. He's still God when he gets there. That's right. Hallelujah. It doesn't matter how bad or how tragic your circumstance may become. When the Lord shows up, it'll be right on time. Hallelujah. Would you stand with me this morning?